All right. Hey, everybody, and welcome to our Zoom conversation about trans folk in the Bible. And today we're going to talk about trans folk in the Bible in three different ways. We're going to start by talking about creation. So, so people who are created and in their bodies, in their stories, they are uh, trans in some sort of way. That can mean that they're gender nonconforming, that they have roles that are outside of the expectation. It could mean that they have some sort of transformation in their story, or that just based on the way people understood bodies and sexuality and gender, that, um, that people had some sort of change in that. So we're, that'll be the first section. We'll talk about people who were created trans in the Bible. Then we'll talk about the uh, Christ figure and how um, Jesus's way of being in the world was a bit transgender, how his body changed in different stages of his life. And then we'll talk more metaphorical, uh, some of the biblical ways that people's gender changes either through through metaphors about how Christians understand the world to work or through physical transformation um, or that, that idea from Matthew 25, the idea that wherever you see someone today out there in the world, that they are the body of Christ. And so that means the body of Christ is very diversely gendered. All right, so starting with creation, and again, uh, feel free to pop in. I'll add some time at the end if you think of more stories as well. Um, th the first one uh, is the story of Adam and Eve. And if you think about how this story is told, you can, you can go back to the original Hebrew and think of there's a lot of different words that are used to talk about trans folk, like tom-toms. And um, I'll put a link at the, at the bottom of the video. Um, to the human rights campaign. They have a workbook on gender and religion and, and it has trans rabbis who actually have written the section on Hebrew stories in the Bible, which is pretty cool. And so they can give you all of the good Hebrew words. You don't need a, a Lutheran who grew up in South Dakota to try to tell you how Hebrew words work, right? Uh, so Adam and Eve, if you think of the story going back to creation. Um, the very first version of the Adam and Eve story, you have this gender neutral being, um, Adam means earth or clay, this gender neutral being who God splits in half by first putting them to sleep. We don't know if God had a little mask or how God did it, but I like to imagine it the way that is the closest to gender affirmation surgery, just because it can give um, power and hope and strength to people who are going through that process. So God puts this being to sleep, cuts something out of their body. The, the, the Hebrew word could mean rib. It could mean like a tendon or a sinew. It means like a clumpy, tough bit. So some bit is taken out of Adam that is declared female. So the female bit is removed and it leaves a scar kind of like this right? Same location as when people have um, top surgery, right? So very similar scar location to, to contemporary trans folk. So you have these two divided bits, but that only happens after surgery, right? That means it, original creation isn't just poof, you are out of your mother, you are born. Original creation in the book of Genesis is, poof, you are created, and now you have a surgery, a divinely guided surgery, right? The second version of the, of the Genesis story is about molding that clay, right? It's about a potter who takes all the mud and makes little clay people, Adam and Eve are clay people. Doesn't seem trans on the face of it, unless you go to Judges, I think it's chapter 19, that says every potter has to reform their clay sometimes, right? It's talking in this text about people who are bad and people who need to be like reformed by God. Um, 
I'm not implying that with trans people. So imagine just the fact that not everyone when they're making pots is as cool looking as Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, right? If you've ever tried making a pot, you like flub it up and you have to start over, right? Clay is a perfect metaphor for making humans because you have to like mold and reform it all the time, right? So both of those first creation stories in the book of Genesis have trans components to them. Does that mean it's the only way you can read it? Absolutely not. It can be a beautiful metaphor for puberty. And when if I was doing a talk on youth right now, that would be the angle that I'm talking about. So none of these stories mean it's the only way to read it. Um, I'm just sharing them in this collection because trans people don't often get a chance to think about trans places in the Bible. Um, and because each time we have a new generation of people we think the Bible can't speak to, Usually their stories were there all along. We just forgot to read them that way, right? So this is just one way you can provide good news to folk who are trans. This next part of Genesis, you have to kind of suspend for a moment your feminist ethic. Don't worry, you can have your feminist ethic back, but just suspend it for a second because sometimes when we take out all of the gender in the Bible when it says he's and she's, we can miss when something changes, right? Or we can miss when something really queer happens. And um, so just for one moment, suspend your feminist critique, which can be the next Bible study we do if we need to, and then just put on your hat of trans people don't get to hear about Bible stories very often. Okay, in the past, People in the Bible, people who were reading the Bible, had an experience of four genders. I don't believe this. Jordan probably doesn't believe this. But the Bible, the ancient people believed this, okay? They thought there were fertile men, infertile men, fertile women, infertile women. So if you started infertile and became fertile, you change genders. Not a good way to categorize people. We don't do that anymore. Your self-worth is not defined by whether or not you can have babies. However, because ancient people believe these were separate genders, every time, the eight times in the book of Genesis that God changes someone's being from someone who is infertile to someone who is fertile, at the time they told the story, the people believed that person changed sexes. We don't believe that anymore, but wow, now you know of 10 times there were transgender people just in the book of Genesis alone. Okay, let's put our feminist hat back on. That's terrible. I can't believe they believed that. Mm, I'm mad. Trans people. Uh, there's also another section of um, the oral Torah. The oral Torah is like when people are like, what does that mean? I don't, I don't know. And rabbis got tired of being asked that all the time. So within their tradition, they're allowed to wrestle with God, right? Because Jacob wrestles with God. Um, and one of the things that they did is they were like, okay, here's why it works. And so like really smart people would have these additions about Bible texts, about Torah texts, um, that were as cool and as fun to read as if they were sacred texts themselves, okay? And so some of the oral Torah texts were trying to figure out about how the 12 people, the 12 men were born who come to form the 12 nations of Israel. And they thought, well, one of the daughters was going to not have a man, not have a baby boy, right? Feminist hat, sorry about that. Um, they were going to not have a baby boy. So of all the girls, in order for fairness, one of the women, when she was pregnant, prayed that the boy in her womb, now it's not clear from the Hebrew if the baby was in the womb still or already born, but one of the women prays that the, da that the son who's going to be born, who's going to be the 12th of the sons of Israel, would turn into a girl. And tradition says that baby turned into a girl. That 
baby who turned into a girl, who started as a boy, then turns into a girl, then gives birth to one of the most effeminate Bible characters in scripture. The Bible character who wears rainbow dresses. Do you remember who that is, Jordan? Who wears rainbow dresses? Joseph? Joseph's mama was originally a papa. Sorry, I was muted. That's no, really okay. interesting. Yeah. So the idea, I think, is because they thought there was an amount of masculine and feminine that when she had her sex change and became male, that gender roles got mixed up in that family. So the story is, well, why is Joseph always wearing rainbow dresses? So that was the story they came up with about that is because Joseph's mama also was gender variant. I remember reading something about the kind of robe that he was given. The, the coat of many colors was only ever worn by uh, princess. Yeah, a princess. So that's, yeah. that's an interesting piece. Yeah. Peter Toscano does a really cool play on some of these characters. Um, can't remember the name of it right now, but I'll put a link to it below um, about some of the different gender um, transgressions, is it called? Maybe. It's a good play. If you haven't seen it before, I think it's on like Amazon now or you can download it. Anyway, so we're sharing some stories. We're in the, um, in the part where we're talking about different characters of the Bible who are kind of trans in and of themselves. Um, in our next section, we're going to talk about Jesus, and then we're going to talk about trans metaphors. Um, we're still in the book of Genesis, uh, but you can add to the pile eunuchs. Uh, eunuchs can be a bit controversial because eunuchs weren't always trans by their own choice. Sometimes their testicles were crushed not with their consent. That's not okay, but also they're um, great vessels of wisdom that we can draw upon if we're looking for cool, intelligent folk who are trans or gender variant in some sort of way. Ethiopian eunuch maybe being the most well-resourced. Ethiopian eunuch um, was the equivalent of the um, secretary of the economy for Ethiopia at the time. Um, in, and he is reading old scripture texts that are saying that people who have damaged testicles can't be anywhere near the center of the house of God. He encounters one of the disciples and he says, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Um, so this is not an accident that he's asking to be baptized. It's not an accident that he's looking to the Jesus community to kind of transform uh, his role in society. It's a very educated academic uh, pointed question at the right person who can kind of um, make change happen in this new movement. And it made for a very trans friendly early Christian church, which is pretty cool um, that people were kind of drawing these inferences with each other. There's a lot to do with wordplay in the Greek about what water means, but we'll talk about that um, in, the, in the metaphor section. Uh, male water car carriers are another part of the, the biblical story. Male water carriers were men who were doing a woman's job. And so, yes, when Jesus talks to the woman at the well, this is kind of an un unusual gender incident, incident that's happening, right? Because men don't go to the well unless they're proposing to someone or they're that intimate with the woman that they're hanging out with. So in John's gospel, when Jesus tells people where to go find the location of the Last Supper, he says, go find that dude who carries water, which was an unusual thing because that person was outside of the gender roles and people would have known about that. There's also some, um, some exegesis by folk like Ken Stone who talk about what does it mean that circumcision is one of God's major rituals? What does it mean, right? It certainly means that in a male-centered society where basically it was the symbol of your power, there was a lot of phallocentered gods during that time, that a god who can reshape 
your phallocentric organ is one who has conquered kind of this patriarchal society that God is reordering and reshaping things. The reason that I bring it up is not just to like make people who are participating in the Zoom make funny faces, which is fun and worth it for me, um, but also because if, um, if you think about it, trans folk who change their relationship and maybe have phalloplasty, the places they end up with scars are the same places people end up with scars um, in circumcision. So for someone who doesn't get circumcised, a trans person looks more like them than others. What a beautiful time for my kids to come and wave at everyone, right? Thank you. <laughs> Sound good. Anyone else know of other Bible characters that we should talk about that you wanna like make mention of? No? All right. Yeah. You do what? Um, hats are beautiful and they're Great. in there. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> there's, um, there's a number of other um, kind of gender bending um, Bible characters, some of which are, if we put our feminist hat back on, right? If we put our feminist hat back on where we're like, yay, women can do everything. Um, some of those stories of, of female transgression, of people who become warriors, of women who are prophets um, or, or priestesses, we could put them in the category of kind of trans Bible stories just because we want to have a full basket of trans stories as resources for people who feel like there are no stories that are about them. Or we could just like let there be a feminist basket too and not have to like have all the baskets for ourselves, right? So Yael, who's driving tent pegs through the heads of men, could be one of those stories if you wanted to keep them. It's just really fun to say tent peg in mind, right? Uh, so the section, second section I thought we would talk about is transness in Jesus's story. Um, Jesus, through the transfiguration, clearly has some sort of bodily change. Um, as you just saw, my children are black. And so it's always interesting for me to talk about Jesus suddenly being white from whatever Jesus was before that. Um, the interesting thing of the transfiguration story is, is that we don't really have a good description of Jesus's body other than the color of it. Uh, we know that Jesus's body changes and it changes enough that even the, the disciples who get everything wrong all the time noticed. Um, but certainly there is some sort of change. Jesus has moments of going to the well, like we talked about before, of doing kind of transgressive, gender norming activities um, and kind of the biggest moment that we have well I guess we have if we're going to talk about Adam and Eve having their scar right here when Jesus gets poked in the side Jesus is going to have a scar kind of in a similar location as some some trans folk might but the most obvious way that Jesus's body we know for sure changes is that when Jesus comes back from the dead no one recognizes Jesus right Jesus's physical body has changed in such a way that is really hard to pinpoint. And it makes for some really fun stories right away after Jesus comes back from the dead, right? Um, Jesus can magically appear in a room where all the doors and windows are locked, right? But you can touch Jesus. So how does that happen, right? So Jesus's body works in a form and a substance that makes no sense to us. Like, let's uh, let alone the fact that like Jesus could like transport 2,000 years into the future and be in our bread and wine, right? So Jesus's body doesn't necessarily work for us. Jesus is how it comes together after the resurrection. We don't understand that. There's um, stories of Jesus on the Emmaus road having day long conversations with people who knew Jesus very intimately. And people are like, never knew it was you till you held that fish, man, the way you held that fish. What does that mean, right? I don't know. What it means is that whatever Jesus's body was, was different, right? So different that the only way you notice that it's Jesus is by saying a word that was really similar and you're like, oh yeah, 
oh yeah, that's you. Cause you always say dude at the end of your sentence or whatever it was that made people notice that it was Jesus. Um, yeah, Jesus helps people kind of sort their fish and then helps cook. Like Jesus seems to be very involved in cooking um, in whatever their post-resurrection body is up to. But then also there are stories where Jesus is just like gone. As Soon as you recognize Jesus, Jesus's body is not there anymore. Right? So it's a weird substance. We don't know how to talk about it in the scripture. All we know about it is that it is completely different. Are there, do you guys know other moments where Jesus's body changes or is funny or transforms? No? All right. Well, let's, let's talk about metaphors then, because just as in, in the same way that we don't kind of know what happens to Jesus physically in a post-resurrection world, we then are left with all of these great metaphors for what the body of Christ is that allow for us to see trans folk as a part of this sacred story. So there's, there's Matthew 25, which tells us that wherever we see the homeless, the hungry, the naked, um, that there we have encountered God. And so metaphorically, the fact that trans people exist today, and you can, don't touch them without their consent, but, you, but they exist, right? Means that when you encounter a trans person, you are encountering the body of Christ, regardless of whether or not you feel like their transness is acceptable to you, in the same way that you might not have wanted to see a naked person or not have wanted to see a homeless person or, or whatever way that you're encountering God kind of outside your means. Early Christians, however, were super into trans people. Like so into trans people that it bugged church higher ups. Um, and there's a couple of ways that this is manifest. There's a really great book called The Female Men of God. There were whole monasteries where their language about how the dude bros followed Jesus was that they had breasts and could breastfeed each other. They believed that their teaching of each other, their mentoring each other was like literally because Abraham had a bosom. Everybody sing that weird song, rock of my soul on the bosom of Abraham. Never thought it was weird till I read this book about all of these early church folk who believed that they were that when they shared the love of God, they were sharing the breast milk of their knowledge with other people in their monastery. They had a lot of really, really interesting ways of talking about what they were doing. Um, whether or not we would want anyone to replicate that now and have conversations like that in their like male only spaces, can't speak for all feminists in the feminist bucket, right? But it's kind of interesting that in a, in a church that is thought to be super patriarchal, there is a group of like dudes in the woods who didn't ever talk to anybody who were like, let's try to be more ladylike. Like, that's kind of cool. Um, there was also the opposite of that. There were females who joined monasteries and who lived as men and who believed that their living as men was a part of their Christian journey. And um, there's at least 13 different saints that are in the Catholic prayer calendar that I've, that I've figured out um, who were saints because people thought it was cool when they figured out they were trans at the end of their lives after they died. This happens, um, this is a, a, a warning alert that I'm gonna say a word that's gonna make people have faces in a second, okay. It happens because of Greek wordplay and you can find this wordplay in Aristotle um, if you're nerdy enough to look for it there. Um, because in ancient Greek, the word for sperm is a combination of two Greek words. One that is water and one that is spirit. So in a ritual where water and spirit come together, you could get a sacred sperm 
that would cause people to be born again spiritually. Yes, it is in the Bible all over the place. Go back and read those texts about when Jesus is trying to describe to people what it means to be born again. He's you. Mm -hmm. He is talking about Greek word play. It's hard to preach this in front of other people because you have to say the word sperm a lot. Um, but okay, I'm going to try to not make lewd gestures that become memes. But um, now that you know that this word play exists, when you go to super high church for Easter, not this year, but when you go and look at their live stream videos, right, you're going to see in their ritual, everyone in the church knew Jesus was talking about sperm, okay? Because on Easter, there's this thing where you get a brand new Christ candle and you parade it into the church. Anyone ever seen that ritual? And then you go to the baptismal font and you dunk it. I'm not telling you what my gesture is. Yes, you figured it out, good. You dunk it three times or until the wax drips off the candle and into the water, people. Uh-huh, and then you go put it into the candle holder because it was a ritual about Spirit and water coming together. So in the Nag Hammadi text, there is a book um, called the Gospel of Thomas. In the Gospel of Thomas, remember because they weren't good feminists yet, they took off their feminist hat and they thought, we're so mad that Mary's so smart. Why is she the smartest disciple? This is terrible. It must not be because we're dumb. It must be because she becomes a man in baptism because women can't be smart. So Mary must have become a man in baptism when the water and the spirit and the sperm and the thing. Yeah, it's like four paragraphs of them saying Mary's not smart enough because she's a girl, but why is she so smart? Oh, because of baptism. So because they wrote down that they thought when you become baptized, you lose the ignorance of being female hmm, and other dumb things early Christians said. Um, people read those texts and women who wanted to live as men went, cool, I found a faith where I can like be a guy now. And they would get baptized uh, you also see this in the Acts of Thecla. Uh, Thecla was someone who hung out with Paul. Yeah, Paul, grumpy Paul, had a trans dude who hung out with him. Um, Thecla, um, Thecla has a very tragic life in and of itself. She hears Paul talking out a window and he's like preaching, la la la, uh, Jesus is coming soon. Let's all be celibate because life is too hard if you're not celibate. And she goes, all right, I'm gonna do that. Her mom tries to fix her up uh, in a marriage and says, you have to get married. I'm your mom, you have to. She says, no, I heard this dude Paul out the window. I've decided I'm gonna be celibate now, right? Remember all of their livelihood, their financial livelihood is based on whether or not this daughter marries well. So she's like, I'm not getting married, you can't make me. Um, there's a number of saints who are pretty cool. Uh, Saint Wilgefortis being one of my favorite. Saints who refuse to marry the people their moms picked out, pray for a sex change to God, wake up in the morning with beards, right? So St. Wilgefortis wakes up with a beard. Guess what? Doesn't have to get married now because she has a full beard, okay? So there's some cool kind of trans saints. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Thecla, Decides she's not getting married. So you know what her mom does in the most loving mom way? She says, burn her at the stake. So her mom ties her to a pyre, sets her on fire, but she doesn't burn because God loves trans people more than Thecla's mom loved her, okay? So she doesn't burn. They try to do other bad stuff to her. She doesn't die. Finally, they get tired of trying to make her die. And they're like, just leave. So she cuts all of her hair off, right? And she dresses like a man and she starts following Paul all around everywhere he's going to evangelize. 
Is Paul happy about it? No, he's like, go away. Everyone hates me because you're trans now. And she's like, whatever, I'm smarter than you. Let's go evangelize. And she does, she just follows Paul around and preaches. Finally, Paul is like, all right, fine. And that's the end of the Acts of Thecla. It's good, you should read it. Um, it. You know, now that you know all the gruesome parts happen. So there was this group of people who in this early, early church, they took this really sexist, language and they used it for their betterment to like live in the bodies that they wanted there's a number of other saints who um, were discovered on their death to have pierced ears oh they were a girl along um is what the ancient people believed um or which i think kind of is saintly uh there are folk who um were accused of fathering children so they're women living as men in monasteries, so they have a vow of celibacy. And the reason they're declared saints is because they knew that they hadn't done it, but they left the monastery and raised the children. Right? Saints. And then upon their death, it was discovered they couldn't have fathered the children, right? And people celebrated them within their communities, like for so long that they're still in the prayer calendars. Yeah, Catholics still have them in their prayer calendars. It's kind of cool. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about those, this is the like weird part, but uh, I did put a bunch of them together. This is called Queerly Lutheran. Uh, it's all, I wrote it in 2009. It's a collection of stuff I researched while I was in seminary. And the back of this, uh, there's some geeky like Lutheran stuff in the beginning, but in the back there's a prayer calendar of different people who are LGBTQ. Uh, there are some other stories that are a little bit more metaphorical, like there's, um, there's someone called the Abbot of Drivendor. That's how I'm gonna say all those syllables go together. They're Welsh, right? Um, the, the Abbot of Drivendor on Easter, this is an East, everyone needs a good Easter trans story, right? Uh, he falls asleep on a rock. The rock he falls asleep on turns people trans. He wakes up and is a woman, leaves his wife and his kids, marries this super hunky dude. The text is really into how hunky the dude is that he marries, okay? Has like nine kids, right? So all the way transformed into a female. But guess what dumb thing he does like 10 years later? On Easter day, takes a nap on the rock. Stupid, right? turns back into a man, wakes, and then his wife sees him, his ex-wife, whom he had left, finds him and is like, what's up? And I think the story like ends where like the hunky dude and the wife like are all, they like live next door or something like Emily Dickinson, her sister, yeah, right? It's some sort of like weird family that comes out of that. That or like, or um, and there's other versions that are like, and then the hunky dude was like, well, bye and they like give each other like a, a hug and they're like best friends forever after that. That one's a little bit more like on the mythical side uh, but it's still fun you know because of Easter. It's the candle, it's the candle. I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, there's, a, there's some other um, stories that you can wonder how the bodies get brought back in a new way. One that's coming up is the dry bone stories, right? Dry bones, uh, you can only preach about for so long because it's like, and then they came back and you, there was an army. Hmm, yay, God rises people from the dead to fight more. That's a weird, weird sermon. But this idea of the dry bones brings just one more metaphor that God can reshape, reconfigure, re-enflesh us, right? So any story that's about people being re-enfleshed um, or coming back bodily in a different way. It doesn't have to be a scary story. It can be like a, yay, our bodies change, and hooray, we can be okay with it, and don't be mean to people in bathrooms, just if you have time at the end. Um, Romans, obviously, is, is one of the easiest metaphors. It's what we put on our, to help ease the, the transition into single stall bathrooms from multiple stall bathrooms, we just put up the, the phrase that said, there's no more Jew nor Greek, no more male nor female, and we just covered up the male and the female sides on, on the bathroom. Um, so if it's really true 
that Jesus gets rid of those divisions, then what does that look like? If we, if we get rid of those, those ideas that say, you're this or you're this, then trans people who are like, nah, I'm gonna be this and this and this and this and this, and I'm gonna be a particle over here someday, a dust that floats through the air, right? So um, the metaphor of we're all dust into the dust, we shall return, like we are not just one thing. Our bodies are not just one thing. They transform, they get reshaped. Um, and, and, and you can see this if you look at early writings about what the Holy Spirit is up to, right? The Holy Spirit, I think in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes changes sex twice. There's a part where the Holy Spirit is male, but there's a part where the Holy Spirit is female. Part of this happens because of language changes, right? Um, in, in the Hebrew way that the language is arranged, I think some of the words for spirit are male. Um, in, in the Greek, some of those words for spirit spirit are female and so these ideas shift and change all the time and we have lots of ways of, of seeing that in the world and so uh, there's plenty more metaphors where that comes from um, and if and certainly if we're looking at things through like a Matthew 25 lens where everyone you encounter can be a part of that sacred story right because the bible ends because people like stop writing it down right on big long scrolly things not because God's story in the world ended. And so if each of our stories adds to this sacred story, then we can add those in there. And, and there's some pretty cool ones. Like Christine Jorgensen was the most famous trans person in the world when she came out after World War II um, because it was really cool in the headlines and because she had these ties to like Denmark. And so it could be a worldwide story. And Christine Jorgensen discovers that she's trans while sitting in a church. Um, she was raised Lutheran, so I guess Lutherans get some credit, but she was in a Presbyterian worship service, so fine, Presbyterians, you can have that one. She's listening to the sermon and she's hearing kind of these messages of God affirming you no matter what happens to you. And it wasn't so much the sermon that helps her decide that she's going to take this trans journey, but the way that the light fluctuates and changes from the stained glass windows. Right. And so if you, her memoir is really funny. If you ever want to, it's not like funny, ha, ha It's just like funny. Like, uh, she really believed she was like the Marilyn Monroe of her time. Like, and she was that popular back then. She was probably one of the most well-known people in the world. Um, so if you want to like look at her biography, it's really interesting, particularly because we don't often get stories of people who talk about what their moments are when they decide to take different trans journeys that connect them to a worship service or connect them to a faith, a faith journey. Um, Kate Bornstein does. She was going up to the top of a mountain because she had read about these like ancient aesthetic people who would like kill themselves on top of mountains. She was gonna go to the top of the mountain and like kill herself, but she like got distracted and she ended up becoming a Scientologist, like on boats with L. Ron Hubbard, deep Scientologist, um, and then kind of comes out of Scientology and ends up really interested in BDSM, right? So it's a weird faith journey, uh, but it still is a trans journey that's like the conversation is about how faith and thinking about faith kind of goes through the shifts and turns. So there's lots of contemporary books where people are, are more open about what their spiritual journey is, is like. And so those are also, I think, a part of the great canon that we just, it would be too heavy if we carried it around. Metaphors, anyone else got metaphors? Or you just, you all seem very comfortable listening. And <laughs> The only thing that I could think of, um, oh gosh, I lost everyone. Whatever. No, you. Oh, you can see, okay, great. My phone just glitched then. Um, was I medical instead of dunking uh, <laughs> with baptism? Yeah, that's a any way to look at it, right? Yeah, yeah, and and that those traditions come come from like mikvah traditions, kind of in in the Hebrew traditions, and and feeling like you can get a fresh new start by encountering some sort of sacred water. And the the beautiful thing is that there's 
bodies of water kind of all over this planet that people see as being sacred um, and ways that you can encounter those rituals uh, in very different ways. But I think you're right that um, what we might do to prepare ourselves for any part of our trans journey that we do in private might be very different than the public ritual we want to have with like a group of people. And so the ways that we can consider public rituals being a little bit safer uh, is a really good thing. Like for me personally, like when I was um, gonna have a surgery, I wanted to remind people that I had not given them permission to be praying for specific body parts on my body because if I have a private part and someone has a prayer that they want to lift up, that doesn't mean I want them to spend 20 minutes imagining my private parts improving. Um, God knows what's happening and God can like help with what's happening, but um, body privacy can be a really important thing. It's part of what's really difficult about talking about trans Bible characters in, in particular is we don't know how they would choose to self-identify, right? Trans wasn't a language that happened back then. And just because someone was born female and lived as a male doesn't mean they consider, they would consider themselves trans if we could like wake them up and ask them in the middle of their story. And so it becomes, it becomes a really tough thing. Like Joan of Arc, it would be really easy to assign her story as a trans story because she is killed because she refuses to wear female clothing. But she also has other moments where it looks like she might not be killed, where she renounces all of that. We can't, from the distance of the past, just freeze anyone's story into one moment of time to categorize them, um, unless that story keeps someone alive and then by all means like falsely tell someone's story because any story that helps someone have hope or life or joy is a good story for today. And then tomorrow we can kind of like talk about stories in a safer way or in a way that is more nuanced and fuller and talks about intersections and all of those things. And so that's kind of my hope is the more that we can see trans folk in Holy Scriptures, the more that we can treat people like their, their lives are sacred and worth staying alive. And the more that we can enhance our faithful vocabulary, the more we can understand some of the nuances of God that we've kind of just ignored because it was too hard to use uh, they or them pronouns or to have gender neutral ways of talking about what happens with God. And um, right, all of those intricacies that happen when talking about God, when we don't read Hebrew is part of it, right? If you think of all the hundreds of names for God in the Hebrew Bible, you have everything from El Shaddai, God the many-breasted, to some some very like, like Book of Hosea is very phallocentric and very deeply rooted in dudes loving dudes, right? It's a story, Hosea, if you haven't read it, is a story where God tells a man, um, Hosea, Hosea chapter one, verse two, and God said to Hosea, go take of yourself a wife of whoredom. Just an interesting way to start a story. Um, but the, the idea is that uh, a marriage between a man and a woman, if you leave all the genders in, is not faithful and full of all kinds of complicated uncertainties. Sacred marriage like that between God who is very male and the sons of Israel, right? So this holy marriage that is between men. And it's problematic in every possible way from a, a feminist lens, but very interesting if you think about gender and what that looks like in, in scripture conversations. You won't find it in the NRSV because it won't say the sons of Israel, it will say the children of Israel, right? And so that's the other thing to pay attention to is that when, we have fixed one issue in scripture, we sometimes erase other people. And I'm not gonna tell you which Bible version you should read. Um, it's super hard to learn a language. So going back into those, those ancient translations can be really hard too. But be open to sometimes reading different versions because you don't know what the translation has done. King James, King James version of the Bible was specifically written to say mean things about King James, who was effeminate, 
and had a sexual relationship with men. Surprise, surprise, you find lots of hateful words in that translation of the Bible about people who are effeminate and people who have sex with men, right? And so every translation is going to have bits it's not getting right. So you might want to have multiple Bibles that you're looking at, some of which help you in this area and some of which help you in this area and some of which help you in this area. Yeah, just a thought. Anybody else have any more ideas? You're all very contemplative today, that's good. Well, I'm grateful that you came. I'm grateful that we had some time to, to share some Bible stories. I hope that you will um, look at scripture with, with new eyes, perhaps, maybe looking for some more of the places where there's fun wordplay, more of the places where um, trans type things were happening and you just didn't miss it. And then hopefully our like thinking about sacred text in this way gets us ready for whoever the next group is that the next generation decides God can't love them because it will be just as much of a lie for the next group as it is for all of the groups kind of going into the past. All right.